you everybody for being here. I'm Barbara Thoreau and I'm a member of the board of directors for the book festival. So we're very glad to have the festival up and running and having all of you here. Um, and we encourage you to buy merchandise, buy books, and continue to interact with all the authors that we have here this weekend. We're very blessed to have this happening. Um, the, I looked up the title and I forgot. It's writing and in, in, where wildlife and humans meet. And as I was like sitting next to Mike, he said, or how they interact or don't interact. Because he, he was out walking and <coughs> looking for grass and fell, and that's why he has crutches. <laughs> <laughs> so our two panelists both live in Missoula. Christopher Preston is a writer, a professor of philosophy, and a one-time commercial fisherman who is obsessed with the sight of freshly falling snow. Gotta love it. That's a great line. <laughs> and he's a distinguishing visiting fellow in the ethics of the anth anthropocene. Anthropocene. Big words, this is why I don't want to do introductions. <laughs> Tenacious Beasts, this is nature writing for the anthropocene, touching on different facets of ecological restoration for indigit with indigenous knowledge to rewrite wilding practices. More important, the book offers a roadmap and a measure of hope. That's what we all need now. If we're gonna in interact with each other, we need to have that hope. Smee B. Collar, the third, is the author of more than 80 award-winning books, including Popping Ahead of Climate Change. A lot of his books are geared to a younger audience. So he does a lot of school visits and library visits, but it's teaching early on how humans is a very important thing to get them educated enough to then read Christopher's books. <laughs> and he has some information over here on some of his other books. And that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to turn you guys loose. Perfect. Thank you for being here. Yeah. By the way, uh, I, I just want to thank Barbara. Barbara, if you don't know Barbara, she <laughs> is a pillar of the community and was one of the instrumental people in making this beautiful facility happen. So I would like to give her a call. And I had to retire too. Well, how's that sound? Good. Good. Thank you, Barbara, for the kind introduction <laughs> and for everything that you do in this of course. Um, Sneem and I spoke beforehand and agreed that I'd go first. I'm going to talk about this book, Tenacious Beasts. So I want to give you a flavor of what I mean by Tenacious Beasts. And I'm going to start by reading the first paragraph of the book. Standing on the dock in the dead of Arctic winter, Schweinandus closed his eyes to the northern lights above. All the professor wanted to do right now was listen. As the mountains and green aurora faded from his retina, sound of a gently rippling ocean washed over his body. Seconds after his mind quieted, he heard the splash of a large object, followed by a fierce exhalation of air. Then he heard another. Then another. A fishy scent wafted shoreward, casting his head back to the sky, Sven Annis's mouth cracked open as he drank in the frigid nighttime air. He was perched on the doorstep of whales, dozens and dozens of whales, humpback and killer whales, drawn to Norway's Kalfjord in the winter months to feast on herring. So that opens the book because it's a story about standing in front of a flood of wild animals. And these are wild animals, whales, that have come back from the brink of extinction. So 300,000 humpback whales were killed in the commercial whaling industry before that industry was ended in the 1960s. And since that time, those whales have just come rushing back. And so I put that at the start of the book, and I wanted to read that to you to convince you that there is hope out there. We are in a biodiversity crisis, and nothing that I say in these pages denies the biodiversity crisis, but there is hope out there. 
And so what I wanted to do was to select the species that are actually doing quite well, the good, good news stories, the surprising stories. And I wanted to profile them in such a way that we could learn something from them. And so one of the messages, that the sort of simplest and the clearest message in this whole book is we can do it. We play our cards right, and we can get over the biodiversity crisis. So I wanted to paint a picture of what that future would look like if we do it right. And then beneath that, another thing going on in the book is asking of us the question, how would we think about animals differently if this were to happen? How could we change our mindsets so that we can figure out how to get along with animals? Because one of the things I learned in researching this book is that animals want to live. Evolution fixed it that way, right? So that if you can, you will survive. And so Robin Kimmerer, the Potawatomi plant ecologist, says natural systems have no other goal than the proliferation of life. I mean, that's essentially what they do. And so I wanted to give readers a chance to see that that is what animals are trying to do. They're trying to live. So the species that I talk about in here, I, I actually, I have probably a dozen or 15. It kind of depends how, how you count them. But they run the gamut between species where all you have to do is leave them alone and they survive. And so those humpback whales are a good example. All we had to do was to stop killing them and they survive. But it runs the gamut through to species that actually need quite a lot of help. And so one of the species I discuss that falls into that category is the northern spotted owl. The northern spotted owl are getting hammered by barred owls. So barred owls didn't used to be in the northwest, but they are now. And they're bigger and they're more aggressive. And the northern spotted owls are essentially, one biologist says they're circling the drain. We can help northern spotted owls, but the way we do it is by shooting barred owls. And I went out in the forest with a technician who'd spent the last five years shooting, she told me, up to 350 barred owls. So there's like a heavy investment of time and energy in trying to make it work, trying to help these northern spotted owls to survive. So on the one end of the spectrum, the whales, wolves, beavers, these are animals where the conservation strategy is this, stop killing them, and they come right back. And then on the other end of the spectrum, the uh, northern spotted owl, the California condor, a very rare bear called the Marsican brown bear in Italy, which I talk about in here, species that require a lot of uh, intervention, management, maintenance. And there's no one rule here. It's a kind of a case-by-case -case basis for who needs what. Now, when these animals do recover, if they do recover, we're going to bump into them. So gone are the days when, if there ever were such days, when wild animals live in the wilderness and we live in the cities and we can keep these two separate. We're going to run into these animals on this packed planet on which we now live. And so if these recoveries happen, we've got to start to think differently. And, and I'm actually a philosopher by trade. And so there is a little bit of philosophy in here. Like, how do we think differently about these animals so that we can get along with them? And I just want to read you a, a second little paragraph here, also from the intro, just to give you a, a sense about the displacement that occurs when animals recover. On a rural road in Canada a few Octobers ago, I pulled the car over to stare at two long-legged animals loping confidently through an adjacent field. They trotted nonchalantly along, not far from several dozen unconcerned cows. I'd never seen a wolf outside of a national park before, but I knew instantly what they were. When I lowered my window, the pair of wolves stopped and stared directly at my vehicle. There was an assertiveness in their look. They belonged on the landscape. As I admired the luster of their coats and the muscled curve of their haunches, I felt my place in the world shift just a notch. The feeling was uplifting, but at the same time, 
mildly disorienting. I hadn't expected them there. Something in my mind had to shift. The wolves finally grew tired of looking, bumped shoulders, and resumed their lope across the field. I drove the car back onto the road with electricity coursing through my blood. The feeling did not fade for many miles, and it persists in the pages of this book. So some of these animals are going to show up close to where we live. Uh, in that case, we're talking about farmland. But when I talk about wolves in Europe in this book, we're literally talking about the edges of towns, inside of towns. There's a remarkable video on YouTube of one of the first wolves back in the Netherlands literally loping down the sidewalk in a village not that far from Amsterdam. So we're going to have to confront these animals. They're going to be in our spaces. And yes, that's a challenge, but it's not completely unusual. Think about how many animals live in urban spaces already, whether that's raccoons, whether that's birds, whether that's insects. And in Missoula, we're lucky and pretty unusual that we get some of the dramatic animals in town too, right? <laughs> Last fall, 150 bears within the city limits of Missoula. And in the last month, my wife and I have had a lot of joy sitting on our back deck as it gets dark, watching bats move over our yard. What an alien form of life. They're still mammals, but they're so different from these mammals. And yet we share space with them and we love to share space with them. And so the joy and the challenge of animal recovery is going to pose questions of us. But I hope it's a challenge that, that we can meet. And part of what I want to do in this book is just sort of poke and probe and, and set us up in such a way that we can meet that challenge. So I'm going to turn it over to Sneed, who can pick up from there. There we go. Can you hear me all right? Great. Well, I was so glad to get invited to speak with Chris. And once we started talking, I realized uh, how much overlap we have with our interests. And that actually, to be truthful, happens a lot with writers. You know, like uh, a, write, a book will come out and a hundred other writers will go, that person stole my idea, you know. But it's not that, it's because we're all influenced by a lot of the same things. And so um, while Christopher was working on his book, I, I was working on a picture book about animals that are successful in urban areas. You know, it won't be out for a couple of years. Uh, but it, it's the kind of thing that I've been thinking about a lot too. And living in a place like Missoula really reinforces that because uh, as Christopher said, we are so lucky in that we're in a city, but we have wildlife moving through the city constantly. And it's a good place to reflect about the role of humans and what we can do to assist wildlife. And a lot of my own writing reflects that as well. A few years ago, uh, my son and I, we, were, we uh, started doing what's called a big year. Raise your hand if you know what a big year is. Okay, uh, what is it? Exactly, you go out and you try to see as many bird species as possible in a given area in a single year. There's a great movie called The Big Year with Owen Wilson and Jack Black. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. It's hilarious and delightful. And my son and I had just um, started birding when my wife Amy back there rented the big year for us. And after it was over, my son looked at me and said, Daddy, we should do a big year. He was 12, I think, or 13 at the time. So we did. And I think we got about 120 species that first year, which we didn't know if it was good or not, you know. But we kept learning, and then in 2016, we did a more serious big year. 
And it was assisted by the fact that I had two out-of-town trips arranged for us. First, we went to Arizona and birded, and then we went to uh, the Houston area of Texas to bird. Now, every year there in Texas, uh, there's a place called High Island. And in April and May, thousands, of, more than 10,000 birders converge on this place. Why? Because migrating birds are making a direct flight across the Gulf of Mexico to the United States. It's an 18-hour nonstop trip. When they get here, they're totally exhausted, and they look for the first place they can land and rest and eat food, right? And for many of them, it's High Island, Texas. And so we went down there, and sure enough, there were migrating birds just sitting exhausted in branches everywhere. It was great. And so this gave me this idea to write about um, a, a book. I, I titled it Raining Down Warblers, because warblers are the marquee birds that people want to see when they go there. And here in Montana, if you work hard, you might get a dozen species of warblers in a year. Back east, it's like 40 or more, right? So it's pretty incredible. And so I wrote this book, Raining Down Warblers, which uh, was about, I decided to follow one warbler, a cerulean warbler, which is a beautiful endangered species that winters down um, in South America. They're, they tend to use coffee plantations a lot, which is really cool. And so, I, but they're also endangered, and so I decided to follow the travails of this warbler as it migrated, flew across the Gulf of Mexico, and tried to get up to its breeding area in the Northeast. So I sent it to my publisher, and he said, I like it, but what if you, in, instead of just making one story, why don't you include the story of a family that's been trying to create backyard habitat and is waiting for these warblers, hoping that some of them will nest in their yard. I'm going, why didn't I think of that? Because I've been doing the same thing in my own yard for like the last 30 years, right? And so uh, it, was, it was really a great idea. Um, and it ended up being this book called Waiting for a Warbler. And it, has, it kind of tells a dual story of the uh, hardships or the challenges of this warbler migrating and this family who's, that's been working on its own yard to put in native plants and all the resources that a nesting pair of warblers might need. And uh, this, this book, uh, it's not my best-selling book at all, but I love this book because it kind of offers a way for us to think about, well, how do we help wildlife if we, if we live in an urban area like Missoula? And unfortunately, Americans have been brainwashed with this idea that a beautiful uh, landscaping job is acres and acres of sterile lawn, right? That's, this has been ingrained in us. You see it everywhere, even in new developments. What do they put in? A couple of ornamental exotic trees and lots and lots of lawn. And so I, I've, this book kind of gave me a platform to start thinking about that. And how can we change this? And so I do have lawn in, in my house. But I've tried to devote at least half of the space to native shrubs, trees, flowers. And it's tough in a place like Missoula because you have these animals that are doing very well called deer, right? And deer are basically this, these pests. And so when I, we moved into our new house, I put in all these beautiful hand-picked native flowers. The deer loved it. It was like a smorgasbord for them. And even if they didn't eat them, they would come and tear these plants out by the root and throw them over there. And so uh, I realized that s there are certain plants that will survive this deer onslaught. Uh, but for the others, I knew I had, I realized I had to protect them. And so, uh, but it's well worth it because now 15 years after we moved in, 18 years, uh, we've got this 
yard that attracts wildlife. And it used to be I wanted to promote birds, right? Now what I want to do is grow insects. That's my goal, is growing insects. And because if the insects are there, the birds will come, right? And since we moved in, uh, we've had, we've, my son and I have counted 67 species of birds in our yard. And which is almost the total for our first big year that we ever did looking for birds. Uh, but the key is, there, there's two keys to creating a functional yard like this. One is grow plants, native plants, that will promote insects. And the other one is have some physical shelter for them. So shrubby things are good for these little songbirds that need places to hide and avoid getting killed by cats or, or you know, falcons that zoom through and things like that. And uh, one of the, the books I found very ex inspiring, I told you a lot of writers are thinking the same way at the same time. Well, one of them is Douglas Tallamy, uh, who has a book, pretty recent book, called Nature's Best Hope. And he really takes the ideas I would just mention uh, to their full extent, and I highly recommend this book. It's very readable, entertaining, and let me just read a quote from this book by him. You can tell why I don't sell more books, because I'm reading other people's books, right? Uh, but I love this quote, and he writes, what if each American landowner made it a goal to convert half of his or her lawn to productive native plant communities. Even moderate success could collectively restore some semblance of ecosystem function to more than 20 million acres of what is now ecological wasteland, bigger than the combined areas of the Everglades, Yellowstone, Yosemite, Grand Teton, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands, Olympic, Sequoia, Grand Canyon, Denali, and the Great Smoky Mountains National Parks. I mean, imagine that. That much habitat getting restored in our nation. And not only would this contribute to the biodiversity crisis um, that Christopher so eloquently talked about, it would make our own lives so much better. I think, what's the difference between staring out at a sterile lawn and staring out and seeing Western tanagers out there with their bright red heads and yellow bodies and black wings. And so, uh, so I thought with this, with this festival today that I would talk uh, mainly about this. And I made up a handout for getting started here. And I talk about the benefits, but I also um, give some basic guidelines for how to get started. Um, and I also list some places where you can buy native plants and some list of the flowers, shrubs, and trees that I found were particularly successful in growing in a deer-infested area. And so uh, that handout's over there, and I hope you all pick one of those up, along with uh, some other paraphernalia that I brought. Help yourselves over there. But with that, I would like to uh, open it up for some questions right now. So anyone have any questions for either of us about anything we talked about or things we didn't talk about? Yeah. It's, uh, Christopher, about um, how you incorporate your passion for wildlife and biodiversity in your philosophy courses. Are you, are you teaching courses <laughs> as well as research? Yeah, I, I do teach at the university, teach environmental philosophy, yeah. Well, let, let me give you a little background. Can you tell I have a funny accent? <laughs> it's not a Montana accent. Uh, but I came out to the United States uh, three decades ago because I wanted to live on a landscape that had some genuine wildness to it. Because I thought, I can't find that in England. It's too many sheep. But I can find that in Montana or Alaska. I spent a lot of time in Alaska when I first got over here. And so I thought there was all this wilderness and all this wildlife in the wilderness. And I, I sort of drank that Kool-Aid for uh, maybe a decade or so. 
But I've started to realize that I was actually pretty mistaken in this idea that the wildlife lives in the wilderness and that's kind of the end of the story. I mean, one of the obvious reasons why I was mistaken is this idea of wilderness is very much a European construct and it doesn't pay attention to the long inhabitation of the land by indigenous people. So that was one clear mistake I was making. But another mistake was that wild animals, they don't just live in wilderness, they live wherever the habitat's good. And sometimes the habitat in, in a backyard uh, can be incredibly productive. So what I found is that in my classes recently, it, it goes a long way to talk about breaking down this, uh, this sort of wild civilized divide, this idea that uh, the wild is one thing and it's the non-human place for non-human animals and the civilized is another thing, and that's where us humans live. I mean, I, I'm really pretty convinced that that's a bad way to start thinking about the world. Um, and a better way to start thinking about the world is that we are animals, and there is wildness right here on this street, as well as up in the recreation area there, as well as up in the wilderness area beyond. And so we try in my classes to talk a lot about how um, wildlife and wildness really is spread throughout all of these different environments. And it seems, if I could just follow on that, um, you know, when we think about civilized versus wilderness, and you talk about you know, being an indigenous territory, that was the whole European mindset, that civilized is good, wild is bad, and, and wow, that's really an important concept for all of us to get, that there's not a better and worse there's actually a ton of philosophy in all of this. We, you know, we don't have to go deep in it, but it's a very, it's a big sort of philosophical issue how we chop things up and how we think about things like that. Yeah, so you talk about the Anthropocene. Does that not feel like a binary in itself, or is that just a trend in academia um, that people want to separate? This is what we can do. We're greater than environment. So are folks familiar with this word Anthropocene? No. So the Anthropocene, it, it's like a fake geological term. So like you've heard of the Pleistocene, you know, woolly mammoths, ice ages, all that sort of thing. Um, and then the Holocene, that's actually the period we're kind of in right now. But there's this word floating out there, the Anthropocene. And it's the idea that now we're in a human age where humans are actually one of the primary forces shaping the planet. So with the introduction of this word, we have to think about our role. Um, what is our role? Is our role to control the landscape? Or is our role to try and restore, to sort of back off and restore what happened before human population got so big and consumption got so high? And again, th these are sort of difficult questions about what, it, what is it to be a human on this beautiful planet? Like, what should we be doing? And so when I, I mentioned there shooting barred owls to protect spotted owls, um, is, that, is that something humans should be doing? Or should we back off and see what happens. I mean, let's have a snap vote. Who would be in favor of shooting barred owls to save spotted owls? Yes, in favor? Against? <laughs> Maybe slightly more against. And, and against it, why? Do you want to tell us why you're against it? Someone who's against it. I'm going to but I guess I'd like to know more research. I mean, how, how is the strategy decided on? So it, it's not yet official policy. But when I went out on the forest, there was an experiment, a five-year experiment going on. And the results of the experiment are unequivocal. If you shoot the barred owls, the spotted owls have a chance. If you don't, the spotted owls die out. It, it's that simple. So. Federal and state agencies are trying to decide whether to make that policy or not. 
Well, they're not going to go extinct because they basically stretch. It's, I think, the second most common owl, and they stretch from the East Coast all the way to the Pacific Northwest and down towards California. So they're not going to go, the barred owls won't go extinct, but they will be kept out of that crucial spotted owl habitat. It actually brings up a, a whole can of worms for a lot of species because what they think that the reason the barred owl was able to spread here is because of human activity, right? And without that, there would be this impenetrable divide of the Great Plains for the barred owl. Uh, but because we planted trees all the way across the country and everything like that, they were able to get out here. But we're going to run into this over and over again with invasive species impacting native species. And a lot of those invasive species are quite cute and adorable. For instance, cats, house cats, right? Having a terrible toll on birds, right? They think that house cats may be the biggest threat to birds in the United States. They think there may be a, more than 100 million free-ranging cats, house cats, on the landscape. And these are both pe from people who let their cats outside, but feral cats as well. And the impact, they estimates have run as high as 4 billion birds a year being killed by these house cats. So, do we go out and start shooting house cats? Well, there are people who are trying to like uh, these, these kind of uh, feed and neuter programs, right, where they attract them in. Uh, and that makes the people feel better, but it's a fantasy as far as this making any significant impact on what these cats are doing. Um, because it takes tremendous money, tremendous energy, and the results are even mixed because often these stations attract more wild cats to them, or feral cats or outdoor cats. So what do we do? Well, we got to think about it. For me, it's a no-brainer we start controlling these cats and so that these birds have a, a chance. But a lot of people love cats, right? And so talk about philosophy. You could probably teach a whole class just on house cats and birds, right? And so, yeah. Try and stay away from sensitive topics like <laughs> personal, personal pets. But you were going to add something. Bar the barred owls. No, they're, they're pretty, uh, they're powerful enough to survive out there in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so it does look like the only option is to shoot them if we want the spotted owls to survive. I spoke to a biologist at Oregon State University and he knew all about spotted owls and barred owls and he said, well, this is kind of what it's come down to. On, on that topic, it's more, it, it, I'm more conflicted about the word we, as in, if I have to go out and shoot barn owls, it's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, it, and and so uh, so how does that jive with, uh, uh, you know, me personally not being willing to do it, but yet maybe knowing that it's might be the best course. Well, we, we let a lot of people do our killing for us. Uh, if, if, if we're meat eaters, we let people kill those livestock. We all let um, animal wildlife services kill pests. Uh, 25,000 beavers a year, for example. Tens of thousands of coyotes. And we tend not to notice it. We, we tend to let it happen for the status quo. Until a very charismatic species shows up, and we have to weigh in on it. And the northern spotted owl is an interesting case in point, because northern spotted owls are so gorgeous. I mean, if you see those photos of them, especially the young ones, little kind of fluffy balls of fur. Um, and we spent a couple of decades trying to protect habitat for northern spotted owls in the timber wars in the 1990s and early 2000s. So, Northern Spotted Owl is charismatic, it's well known. We've already invested time and money into saving it. And so there we have to think a little bit harder about our killing rather than just ignore it. Um, and it, yeah, this is tricky stuff. Yeah, the more you know, the more you know, the more complicated it gets. And, but, you know, we, we do make moral judgments as humans and we have to decide 
what we want, what's best for the planet. Um, do I want a world with northern spotted owls in it when my kids grow up? Yeah, I do. Are barred owls adorable and amazing? Yes, they are. But they're also, they're doing fine where they live naturally. And so I'm going to make that moral judgment that, yes, we hire people to go shoot barred owls, you know. And, uh, and the same for cats and the same for a lot of other things. So, uh, because basically if you, you say, oh, no, let's not kill the cats. Well, you are still making a moral judgment. You are deciding that all those other birds will die. That's what you're deciding, you know. And so a lot of people, um, especially in the animal rights world, they kind of avoid that thing. Oh, no, I'm going to save the cats. No, but you're also deciding to kill the birds, right? You know, so, so it, it is a tough decision, but something all of us should be thinking about. Yeah. To managing urban wildlife. Uh, I lived in Austin, Texas for 35 years, and about 20 years ago, we had a lot of feral cats in the, right in the middle of town. I lived in very central Austin, and uh, the coyotes started moving in. Mm -hmm. And they kill cat is the preferred diet of coyotes. And then once they moved from the feral, they went to people's domesticated cats, and then they went to domesticated dogs. And then they're following grandma, pushing the two-year-old in the stroller <laughs> down the street. So there was a lot of debate about what to do. And it became very paralyzing because people didn't want to call the uh, coyotes and control them uh, because they were very emotional about what that meant, which is basically trapping them. And so it became a really hot debate. But then at the same time, we had 40 to 50 deer sitting in our front yard. And nobody wanted to do anything about the deer. <laughs> but for me, I'm a, bi I'm a botanist, and I had a landscape design build company, used a lot of native plants, did a lot of restoration work, followed Mrs. Johnson, Lady Bird Johnson's full tenant, uh, and worked at the Wildflower Center for many years. But nobody wanted to kill the deer, and they had beer for deer events, and blah, blah, blah. But my thing was, the deer were eating all the oak seedlings. Right. So they were destroying the regeneration of our oak canopy. And a lot of other native vegetation, which also attracts birds, butterfly species that people don't talk about. So there's just this whole complex thing that goes on when you have 40 deer sitting in your front yard. And it got to the point where if you put cardboard out, they would eat it because they were starving. Mm -hmm. And I saw it over the span of my career. They went from just a few deer to a few hungry deer to massive amounts of starvation going on. So it's really a very polarizing when you get into these big urban centers because you're right, wildlife does really well. Certain wildlife does really, really well. Or when the mountain lions, they came in too. Yeah, it's that, and you kind of raise a, several interesting points there. One is that uh, with the cats, you're not really doing them any favors by leaving them on the landscape. The, um, the average lifespan of a feral cat, it, I think most estimates are one to two years because they get eaten by coyotes, they get run over. In our neighborhood, they get torn apart by raccoons. And so, and the same with the deer. The deer get hit by cars. Uh, they are definitely a pest in urban areas. They keep regeneration of native plants from happening. Uh, what you just said, that's a debate here. We've got deer in our front yard. Somebody should be shooting these deer in town. But it's a polarizing, it, it's a very polarizing topic. And so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I live in Helena, and they're shooting a certain number of the deer each year as soon as the population gets to a too high a point. And then the, it's going to the food bank. And um, that, that seems to have worked as a community solution. Uh, no, nobody has been terribly upset about uh, culling of the deer. 
that's good to know. Can I put a piece on, on top of this, this conversation here? Um, because it's, it's a thread that I spend a lot of time thinking about it in, in the book. We've got to be careful that our concepts of animals aren't 19th century concepts. And an animal that really displays this is the wolf. Um, let's say, roughly, we wipe wolves off the landscape for 75 years or something, something like that. Think of what's happened in those 75 years since, let's say, the, the 1930s uh, to the beginning of, of this century. We've learned a lot more about wolves. We've got strategies to uh, prevent them from impacting livestock the way they impacted livestock in the past. We know more about the complexity of their social lives. We know more about if, if we do have to remove a wolf uh, that has been, or, or in, uh, get involved with a wolf pack that has been predating on livestock, we know which wolves to get rid of. You don't get rid of the pack leaders because then the pack fragments and you get a whole set of wolves out there uh, practicing those behaviors. So we can update our concepts of some animals. We know more about them now. We know, for example, that humpback whales contribute to sucking carbon out of the atmosphere by moving nutrients around the oceans. And so we can think of humpback whales differently as allies and partners in the climate change challenge. So part of what I want people to think about if they, if they read this book is that we need 21st century or 22nd century concepts of animals. And you can hear it when you've got a 19th century concept of an animal. And you hear it in our political discourse all the time. And I think we can do better with that. We can update our concepts of some of these animals so that we can cohabit with them more successfully. Um, I grew up in a small town in Arizona, so there was a lot of interaction. There were coyotes and snakes and quail, and just it just was part of every day. Um, and then in Phoenix, <coughs> the AFC West campus, they had a pack of coyotes that they had sort of built from around. And the students were feeding them, and they had the signs on these coyotes, and, and it became this big debate, big, like, because people were treating them like pets. And it was a it, there was a common walking path that's why I went there and and the coyotes would just follow you because they expect you to feed them, right? And they stopped hunting and looking for food. Um, and they eventually were caught and um, they were not really they were actually because they were too used to us taking care of them. Um, but um, the family was moved to I believe too soon, maybe. Um, so I've, I've been, in my life, had a lot of interaction with wildlife, and I guess my question that keeps coming up is when do or do invasive species become part of that landscape and become, I don't know. Naturalized. Yeah, certain. yeah. Um, where is that line, and how does, how does, how do we interfere or encourage that? Um, and how is that defined for That again, it would be like a whole college course or degree, you know, it's, and it is, yeah, it comes up with every species, every invasive species. And, and the bottom line is a lot of these invasive species we're never going to be able to control. And, and so um, what we're talking about, like cats or barred owls, those are some of the rare ones that we actually can do something about. But uh, talk about, you know, Chinese snow crabs or something. I don't know how they'll ever get a handle on those. And, and so, um, yeah, I, I don't have an answer. It, it just depends on how much we value native species, how much effort we will put into protecting them. Uh, but a lot of these species are never going to leave the landscape now that they're here, which is another reason we should be pouring billions into preventing more invasive species from coming. Because we think it can't get any worse. Oh, it can get a lot worse. It, and it will, unless we take steps to really prevent these things from showing up in the first place. Can I throw 
one more piece out there. What do you think about bears and apples? Like, do they not mix? Should we keep bears away from apples? They don't mix. Um, we have a huge apple tree in the house we're um, renting right now, and there's a bear last night out there, and it's peaceful as we be. And I sat there and watched him record the apples. And he ran back in the green park. And I've seen him many times on the walks in the green park. He's docile. He's seen me three feet away, not me because I meant to, but in my runs, in the tree. I think there's bears that need to be aware of and maybe do something with that bear. Yeah, I think and again, it's a home we're renting. The responsibility on my part may be to take all those apples out, get them, and which next week on Saturday there's an event, and that was the plan. <laughs> Rouse Street Creek's had a big event on their apples. That was the plan. We came to us. I didn't get to I think that was a moment that was a nice, not conflict, but a you're here, I'm here, we can go. Mm. So generally there's a policy around these parts of keeping bears and apples away from each other and picking off apple trees so that the bears don't come into town is, is generally recommended here. In Italy, where there are a very small population of brown bears, the Marsican brown bear, they prune apple trees for the bears. Because the apple trees they're pruning are not in the villages. They're just outside in the hills, and they would rather have the bears outside in the hills than have them in the villages. And so when I went out to the Apennines to look at these Marsic and brown bears and figure out what was going on and, and how tenacious were they, it turned out that the right policy for these bears was the opposite of the policy we have here. Hmm. Rather than keeping apples and bears apart, they were trying to get bears to feed on apples. I think that really that particular example really points to how absurd the dialectic can be of like there's human and civilization and there's wild and we have some ability to actually control that boundary. And I think that's what that example really demonstrates is like, no, we, we all exist, so we need to come up with solutions that make sense. Like, keep the bears where we want the bears rather than, you know, because even the best laid plans of taking apples off the trees, well, that might be happening a week for, you know, like, the, you, we don't control it, you know, so I think we are so, and I think it's very much a 19th century model of, like, we do control, or we should control everything, I don't think until we recognize that we actually, we are a part of the landscape, not playing God with the landscape, like, we're not going to to get to that point yet, until we can get there. Yes, certainly we can't be dogmatic. And you know, I came to this as a philosopher, and philosophers say to themselves, I want a principle that I'm going to apply. And in all these cases, I thought, wow, there is no one principle. There's something you do with bears in Missoula, and there's something you do with bears in Abruzzo in Italy. And it's not the same thing. I think our time is up. But I believe we're both signing books right after this. Is that correct? Well, I'll stick around. <laughs> and we can chat. So. And, oh, yeah, and there's some uh, materials over there. Uh, but we'll hang around, so feel free to come talk to us. And really delighted that everyone could show up here today. So yeah, thanks so much.